Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, let's wait for more people as they come in. You can post your name on the chat, get to know people here while everybody's coming in. And thank you for joining us in today's event. Hello, everyone. Welcome. All right. I think we're good to start. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to, uh, to be here today with all of you. Happy uh, International Youth Day 2022. My name is Aya Shebi. I'm the founder of Nala Feminist Collective, and I'm going to be your host with incredible uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, and I'm really hoping this to be an intergenerational conversation. So welcome and thank you uh, to the International Trade Center and the World Intellectual Property Organization for creating this space, this uh, intergenerational space for all of us to be here and celebrate and discuss critical issues uh, for Africa and for African youth and for global youth. Uh, people are signing up, signing up from different countries uh, Please post your country in the chat so we can see uh, where are you coming from. Uh, our panelists also come from all around the world. And today's conversation is really about creativity and innovation, but also an intergenerational solidarity. Uh, we want to tap into this perspective of intergenerational collaboration. Uh, and I'm hoping this audience is also intergenerational. Maybe we can do a, a raise of hand of who is in the audience under 30 years old. Uh, maybe you use the hand up in the bottom of your screen if you're under 30 years old. Hands up, hands up. Also the panelists, who is under 30 years old? <laughs> Amazing, 14 people. Hands up, who's under 30? Who is a proud young leader in the room? Awesome, so now Lower hand, and let's see who is above 30 years old. Uh, our panelists, too, who is a champion of youth and youth agenda? We have a couple of people as well. You're all youth at heart, right? So no judgment. We're all youth because we are here. Either we are youth-led in our work or we are championing the youth agenda. So we're really happy to have all of you here. Today we celebrate our youth, but we also celebrate, you know, the youth of yesterday who paved the way for us. We are a continuation of different generations. There is a, an African proverb that says, when you sit when you're old shows where you stood in your youth. So we really celebrate the determinations of many generations for us to arrive here. And we need to come together. We need to listen to each other. We need to mentor each other. There is no doubt that today we do have a generation gap. The average age of world leaders today is 62 years old, and yet nearly half of the world population is under 30. And when I served as youth envoy of the African Union, I've been calling for a concept I call intergenerational co-leadership, because I do believe we cannot inherit systems we did in co-design. We simply have to start co-leading now. We have to reform together the failing systems. We have to bridge this gap. We have to allow for generational healing. And all of that can happen in the co-creation process. It can happen in building trust, a relationship of trust between all of us and bringing all the generations in the same table. So I think today for me is really a reminder that we are all asking for our generation to collaborate with other generations, but also to express itself, to be, to become, and to pioneer new ways of leadership uh, in different fields, in politics, in entrepreneurship, in activism, in all spaces. And I truly believe it is in the interest of all of us to have young innovators, young advocates, young mayors. It's in the interest of all of us to democratize access and inclusion for youth making lives for themselves. It is in the interest of us all to be the bridges for trade and to open borders. So we really coming together is the wisdom of elders and the innovation of young people being able to communicate and to collaborate. And with that, I think we can take this word to where we aspire to be, to where we deserve to be. There is no 
ordinary time today. We all have been through difficult times, the pandemic, climate change, rising conflicts. And I think this also requires for bold, transformative, exponential, intergenerational and multi-generational solidarity. So this is really the conversation we are hoping to have today and welcome everyone from Barbados, from South Africa, from Sri Lanka. Please keep sharing who you are in the chat, uh, your diversity and the countries you come from. And uh, join the conversation also on Twitter. Use the hashtag Youth Day, tag uh, WIPO, at WIPO and at ITC News as well. So you can be part of this conversation. We are talking about the alternative. We're talking about how we can learn from each other. We're talking about how we can do things differently uh, and collaborate and ask people to join this conversation if you feel that this will be uh, beneficial to them. We want you also to participate in the discussion. So we're going to launch uh, a poll um, and colleagues will launch the poll in the chat. We want you to share your thoughts with us on this Mentimeter poll. Um, around a question of what does intergenerational solidarity mean to you? What does it mean to you on everyday uh, basis? So take some time to participate in the poll and express what would that really mean to you? For me, I mean, intergenerational solidarity uh, starts from, from the family, you know, from sitting with different elders in my family and learning and learning from them, especially elder women, but also in the political space. I mean, I learn from elders wisdom every day and I leverage that to, you know, not do the, do the same mistakes and learn and move forward with more innovation. So please do share also what does that mean to you? And we see some results coming out, knowledge sharing, common interest, trust, Family, keeping our roots, passing on values, curiosity, storytelling, very important. Awesome. I, I, I would like also the team to launch the second question so we can also get a sense on the state, whether you agree or disagree with some of these statements and you can um, Take the poll from one to 10, so you can grade it. The first statement, I meet often with older people than me for guidance. The second one, engaging with people in different age groups benefit me. Uh, I consider solidarity as a key value in my life. And people of different age group have supported me to get where I am today. So, do rate from one to 10 how you feel about these statements. That's amazing. It's amazing that we all value solidarity because we definitely live in a world of crisis and the most powerful power of our time right now is solidarity. Thank you for taking on this exercise. We will keep engaging you throughout and also having you to ask questions when we get into the discussion. But I want now to hand over to Nadine to introduce our keynote speaker. Nadine is the Youth Engagement Facilitator at Word Intellectual Property Organization. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Aya, and thank you for such a wonderful, powerful start to such a special event. Um, and happy International Youth Day to everyone across the world. Now, I'm so happy to be the one to introduce to you our keynote speaker. He is someone who exercises intergenerational solidarity on a daily basis, from lecturing to supervising and even mentoring countless young people. Um, so I can confidently say he really is a champion for youth empowerment. He is the Assistant Director General of the Global Challenges and Partnerships Sector and is the head of WIPO's new youth engagement area. So please join me in welcoming to the floor, Edward Kwakwa. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Nadine, for that warm introduction. 
And let me start by saying greetings to everyone joining us from all corners of the world. For those of you for whom it's good evening, good evening. For those of you for whom it's good morning, good morning. And from Accra, Ghana, and from Geneva, it's a very good afternoon. And let me also wish you all a very happy International Youth Day. What a treat it is to be with all of you on this auspicious International Youth Day. And speaking of the International Youth Day, let me thank our co-sponsors, our joint partners, the International Trade Center for sponsoring this with us. It's been a pleasure to collaborate with them and we very much appreciate them. And to our ITC colleagues, please extend our very warm regards to your executive head, Ms. Pamela Cook Hamilton. And we join her in wishing you and the rest of the world a happy International Youth Day. Now, Ms. Ayachebi, I should say I have joined many who have followed your journey of advocacy and youth engagement in awe in awe of what you have achieved from the revolution of dignity, as you call it, in Tunisia, to your tenure in the African Union as the very first special envoy on youth. And I should like to commend you for your bravery, for your passion, and for your tenacity. I also know that you have youth mobilizing superpowers, quote and unquote. And so I am particularly grateful that we at WIPO and at the ITC are able to jointly engage young people with you all in the service of making the world a better place. This so we can ignite creativity, so we can ignite ingenuity, and so we can ignite an entrepreneurial spirit in young people across the world. Now, the reason we are celebrating youth through a dedicated international day, and in fact, the reason WIPO and ITC have a youth focus in the work of our respective organizations is not because older generations are now dispensable. In truth, the reason for this youth focus is simply that young people for so long have been far removed from formalized economic activity. They have been far removed from systems of knowledge commercialization systems of knowledge commercialization. And here, being at WIPO, I am referring to the intellectual property system. And now we think we are slowly correcting the oversights of the past. So the theme of today's celebratory session, as you all know, is intergenerational solidarity, creating a world for all ages. Ms. Ayashebe has reminded us of that. Ms. Nadine Hakizimana has reminded us of that. And on my part, this theme of today conjures up some memories from my youth. For those of you who think I've never been youth, yes, I have been youth. It conjures memories from my youth, particularly memories of the powerful intergenerational exchange of knowledge and creativity in the art of drumming, drumming. Now drumming, as we all know, is an art form that has been passed down from generation to generation. For those of you who don't know, I grew up in Ghana and incidentally, I am participating from Accra, Ghana. And here in Ghana, I was constantly exposed to drumming in social gatherings drumming in functions like weddings, in functions like funerals from a very young age. And at such events, I was able to listen to elders playing 
And that's when I decided I wanted to learn how to drum. And of course, once you show interest in the craft as a youngster, these social gatherings very easily become lessons of instruction. So they were, they were by no means formal lessons as such. Often we would be confined to the duration of the event. Luckily, the occurrences of functions were rather frequent in my era. And so over the years, I watched countless uncles play the drums. And mind you, in Ghana, where I come from, just about every older man is an uncle. So I would go home and imitate them, tapping away absolutely on any surface I could find. And eventually, I was able to refine my skills. I noticed that as I got older, I was able to pass that skill on to other youngsters as well. And while I never pursued a musical career, the passion for drumming remains very much with me today. These informal drumming lessons from my elders highlighted to me the critical role of exchange between older and younger generations, between older and younger generations in order to preserve, but also to advance some parts of culture. And culture, we all know, is not static. Culture is made, it's adapted, it is remade, it's an art and an innovation. So I really would like to see this kind of intergenerational exchange being leveraged more often and to its fullest extent. In addition, I want you, the youth, to remember that no matter how old you get, you should never lose the creativity and the ingenuity of your youth areas. So now, let's just say I am eagerly looking forward to hearing from the panel of young innovators, the panel of young creators, and the panel of entrepreneurs on the program today. And for this reason, I will not talk much longer. I must, however, part with just a few key points. First of all, I should like to say, while we celebrate the panelists today, and while we celebrate all young people across the world, let us, as elders, be reminded that we also have a role to play to ensure that they have the most enabling environment to thrive. And again, to the youngsters out there, on this special day for you, please be reminded to always dream big. Be reminded to always be authentic, be original, and dance to the rhythm of your own drum, just like I always danced to the rhythm of my drums. You may fail, not once, but many times, but the extent to which you are able to see the lesson out of it will determine how you correct and transform those less losses into wins. The important thing is to be able to transform losses into wins. And in this context, please remember to always value your ideas and your talents because they are capable of transforming the world for the better and they are capable of transforming the world for people of all ages, just as drumming is enjoyed by people of all ages. So distinguished participants, dear youth, on that note, let me again wish us all a happy International Youth Day, and I thank you for your attention. Back to you, Nadine and Aya. Thank you.
Uncle Edward, thank you so much uh, for your words of wisdom. And uh, we stand um, you know, on your shoulders and your generation fight for social justice. I also want my drumming lessons. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we agree with you. We agree with you that culture and art and innovation are powerful tools uh, for our generation conversation. And I really uh, want everyone participating to take away your words of dance, the rhythm of your own drum, really believe in yourself and do it. So thank you for that inspiring opening for us and setting the tone for us that, you know, this is an honest, authentic conversation among people of all generations and around the world. Uh, welcome again to everyone who joined us now. As we go into the discussion, uh, let us also remember the youth who are not in the room, the marginalized, the refugee, the migrant, the displaced, the youth with disability, uh, those who don't have access to internet or electricity, those who are trapped in conflict. I think today is also about our solidarity to every young person today who is hustling and surviving. This is your day uh, to rise, to have more strength, to continue trying and uh, not give up serving your community. Now I want to go into the, the gist of today's session. We have two conversations with inspiring uh, innovators around the world. I was reading the bios in awe and uh, we have Gen Z technologists, we have millennial disruptors, we have senior entrepreneurs with wealth of experience. So I really can't wait to learn from all of them. Uh, and we will, uh, uh, you know, format this discussion into two chats, one uh, with three innovators working with indigenous communities. We want to learn from them how they got to where they are today and the role of intergenerational uh, solidarity in this process. And the second one with four uh, innovators from around the world working at the nexus of science, technology, and youth engagement. And we want to learn how they use their innovation to reach the sustainable developing goals. So without further ado, let's start with the first chat. I want to welcome my panelists, and I hope I can pronounce everyone's name correctly. Um, Anna Sinkovich from the Youth Movement of Indigenous People in Russia. She has been working with many UN agencies on human rights. She's been promoting indigenous communities' knowledge. She's also working on uh, preserving uh, indigenous languages uh, and she loves languages herself. I have many questions for you, Anna, on that. Um, and then we have Herman uh, uh, Santelen, a social entrepreneur, founder of Oaxacanita chocolate in Mexico, uh, preserving the ancestral culture of chocolate in the region. He will tell us more about it. I also have questions about that. Uh, and he also holds a degree in business uh, sciences with impressive academic learning and leadership and entrepreneurship. So welcome, Herman. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Noreen uh, Bautista, founder and CEO of uh, Panublix, a technology innovator connecting tropical textile producers to markets in the Philippines. Noreen holds a Master's of Science and Innovation in Business. She's founder and co-founder of many other ventures. Uh, I think, uh, Noreen, you're a true entrepreneur because I think once you start, you want more challenges and ventures. Uh, so welcome all of you. And I want to start with you, Noreen, actually. How did you decide to create all these business ventures at such a young age and what really inspired you? Thank you so much. Um, and thanks again, uh, ITC, YPO for the invitation. Happy International Youth Day. Um, I come from Iloilo City, Philippines. So hello sa mga taga-Pilipinas. Magandang gabi sa inyong lahat. Um, we speak various languages. Uh, you all know Filipino Tagalog. We have a different language in Iloilo. I am always proud to be Ilongo, which is what we call people from Iloilo. But I did take my university in Manila. And even in the Philippines, you know, we got like 100 plus different languages. Uh, a lot of, like, I think 10 to 20% of our country is also indigenous. And I see some members of the indigenous community here, right? Very diverse. So when we go to Manila, it's the usual, like when you're in the capital, you and you're not from there, you still feel a sense of being othered, I guess. And we felt that. Um, and because we have some, so much regional pride, I always felt the need to really promote my own culture. Um, and it's always been there. But yes, I have been into entrepreneurship because I, well, I did take up a business degree. And as you said, um, once you start becoming an entrepreneur, you really can't stop. Um, and 
I think that the topic is really interesting because I really actually benefited from a lot of mentors that are way older than me. Um, and I really gained a lot of wisdom from them, learning from their mistakes and even my own mistakes really gave me the foundation to, to do what I do now. And it's only in hindsight, I'm already in my 30s, and it's only in hindsight I realized I did benefit from a lot of that. And that's why I love igniting ventures, Panublix being one of them. It actually comes from a, a Hiligaynon word or language, uh, Panublion, which means heritage. And it's only now that when I heard the topic of intergenerational solidarity, such a long word, but in our local language, it's really panoblion. It's really, it actually means like bearer of precious things in our language. Like when my grandmother says, ko ni sa imo, I will pass this on to you. So it's, it's actually core to our company. And yeah, that's how we started it. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, Herman, I want to come to you with a lot of curiosity, actually, because in Africa, there is um, a series of documentaries that exposed how uh, cocoa farmers from particularly Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa have been growing cocoa for years, but never tasted chocolate their entire lives. And I think we need a lot of innovation, not only to preserve and pass on our indigenous knowledge, but to use it to solve our own problem and stop the exploitation of our communities for decades. So I'm, I'm really curious to learn from you and everyone here, uh, you know, about your project in the chocolate industry and your thoughts on this. Okay, good morning everyone from Mexico because right now we are in the very early. So I am very happy to share with you all these very important panels. And I want to congratulate all the youth that is out there making the changes we want for the world. I am very pleased to be here also with you. So yeah, my name is Germán. I am from Oaxaca, Mexico, which is in the south of my country. And as you know, our generation has been living a lot of changes in this world. And one of the most important is that we are more socially conscious about the problems that we face here in, in our world. So as the beginning, I founded seven years ago, Oaxacanita Chocolate, which is our company. We are uh, a indigenous social company that is taking advantage of all this cocoa culture that we have as, as Mexicans. As you may know, uh, cocoa come to the world because Mexico's uh, relationship with the Spanish people. So as many of you can understand, cocoa for our culture has a very deep and important um, place uh, for our communities. And I am coming from the mixed tech culture. Our indigenous mixed tech culture was one of the first in the world that used cocoa and chocolate as a symbol for social union. And as, as a context, our indigenous cultures were used to use the chocolate as a symbol for create social bonds in the community, you know, like as funerals, as weddings, as birthdays. And then in the region where I live, uh, we are considered one of the poorest regions of Mexico. So we decided to create a cultural based business model that can empower our communities because it is very sad to see that right now, Mexico is having a lot of problems with the chocolate industry. Uh, I totally know that Africa has the number one place in the production of the product. But at the same time, here in Mexico, even if we are considered the cradle of it, uh, four out of five chocolates made here in Mexico are produced with foreign cocoa. So we have a lot of opportunities, not only to develop the industry, but also to take again all these traditions around the cocoa and, uh, and, uh, and around the production of it to involve more communities in a different aspect. We know that there are a lot of problems in the industry in Africa, but differently here in Latin America, most of the work in the field is very well connected with the nature. As you know, the indigenous communities here in Latin America were among the ones that were very related with the earth and with the taking care of the planet. So we are trying also to rescue that. And well, uh, we are going to keep the conversation ar around it. And I am more than happy to keep sharing all the thoughts that we have received and we have been learning from this journey. And thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much, uh, Herman. So from the Philippines to Mexico, I want to go to uh, an experience from Russia. Anna, I want to bring you in the conversation here because you're an indigenous fellow at the World Intellectual Property Organization. You can tell us more about that. But also, um, 
personally curious about your work in preserving indigenous languages. This is something I think our indigenous communities also in Africa have been fighting for decades. Um, in North Africa, for example, our indigenous language, Amazigh, uh, is yet to be an official language in many countries. And we're still communicating in the AU and U UN and all these spaces in colonial languages. And yet we're very multilingual. So what's your take on that and, and what innovation you're thinking about in, in addressing that? Ah, thank you very much, Aya, and it's a honor for me to speak today. And uh, I will perhaps share my experience from working at WIPO as the Indigenous Fellow at the Traditional Knowledge Division, but of course I have also a lot to say about the about Indigenous languages. So here at the Traditional Knowledge Division of WIPO, we work on the issues relating to intellectual property, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. And as part of this work, we, of course, engage a lot with indigenous peoples and local communities from around the globe. And uh, speaking about traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions, uh, I would say that traditional, it doesn't mean, mean that they're old or ancient. And just like Edward said before, culture is not constant. And the uh, traditional knowledge is handed down from generation to generation. That's true but it's also constantly evolving, developing, and being recreated by indigenous peoples and local communities. And uh, indigenous peoples and local communities who are the key holders of traditional knowledge and culture, they are and should be considered as innovators and creators as well. And speaking about indigenous youth, in my youth, they are really the key element in the intergenerational transfer or traditional wisdom and cultures. And at some point, indigenous peoples, they should be innovative as well to preserve their knowledge and pass it to the next generations. And I personally have seen many excellent young indigenous leaders and activists who, who have their own businesses, for example, that aims to promote their culture and make living of it. And I also have seen young uh, creators who made uh, applications and software to learn the indigenous language to help to preserve it and to pass it to the next generations. And these few examples show that there is indeed a connection between the preservation of traditional knowledge, but also with innovation and creativity at the same time. And uh, the question is what can be done to protect such innovation and creativity that is based on traditions and these are the issues we are dealing with. And very often the answer is not that straightforward. But in general, I'm glad to say that many countries have developed their own uh, national legislations to protect traditional knowledge and traditional culture expressions. And also here at WIPO, at the international level, we are facilitating negotiations on this issue. And participation of indigenous peoples uh, both young and senior, it's really crucial as the voices should be heard as well in these processes. Absolutely. Um, I want to, since you already led us, uh, Anna, to this question of elder and senior and young, both uh, the importance of their participation. I want to ask all of you on this intergenerational component, because I think when we say indigenous, we are really at the intersection of generations. We all have ancestors and indigenous knowledge. Um, you know, mostly this is through oral history. Uh, many of it was wiped out by colonization and so-called modernization as well. Um, so we have a lot of challenges in preserving that, um, protecting it, but also continuing to, to innovate and evolve. Like it's two fronts of, of, of two fights to, to achieve. Each of you is working with indigenous communities. How do you foster this intergenerational solidarity? How does it allow you to better understand the community, but also leverage on it uh, for future generation, for the innovation that you're, you, you know, you're trying to, to create, to nurture, to, um, to become something that is sustainable and that future generation also, there is no disruption. Um, you know, in, in the context of, of Africa, we always say we have like three 
uh, three generations, they're not communicating. Those who fought for independence and liberations, those who built the, the African nation, and now this, you know, millennials and, and after millennials who are trying to understand this world we live in and, and how does it all make sense. So how do we foster that in the incredible work that you each of you are doing? And maybe I'll start with you, Herman. Yeah, well, I found very interesting to hear that all of us thinking about culture as, a, as an alive component of our uh, world. And culture must be like that, because if not, it's going to die. So when we started Oaxacanita Chocolate, we decided to start by collaborating with some artists and groups, cocoa farmers with traditional women cooks. Uh, and we have been figuring out that, for example, here in Mexico, the average age of a farmer is about 63 years old. And this is a very huge problem for our country in the production of food here. And added to that, most of the elder generations were very close. And it is very important to say this because in most of the indigenous communities of Oaxaca, right now, the elders, uh, most of them are not well disposed to collaborate with youth. So we, as a young company that has decided, you know, like to Im involve with different technologies the, to sell our products, to sell our chocolates, we decided to create also um, a little cocoa school because we know that as social entrepreneur, our work is not only to impact in the current generations that have the needs, but we have to work and to move forward with the new generations. So we decided to create this little school with where we are empowering a new generation of wardens of the planet that are not only consciousness about the importance of the field in the production of food, but actually that are consciousness about the important cultural heritage that we have around cocoa. Because even if, if, if here in Mexico, most of the people can have access to chocolate because it's a very important component of our communities. The people really don't know what cultural background it has in nowadays. So one of the things that we are currently doing is that, try to involve new generations so they can learn from elders. And then we have this need to empower all of us to keep collaborating and to create a more um, important impact here in the region. It's incredible. You, you're playing the role of this bridge so that the communication is also flowing. I remember, you know, a couple of years ago, we did a campaign called Sexy Farming. So we can attract uh, uh, young people into uh, agriculture and farming because you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, Anna, do you want to come in and, into this? Uh, yes, sure. So, yeah, I was thinking recently in our division, we've been trying to engage more with the young indigenous representatives to understand their needs and concerns. And, uh, and just one an example, last year we launched a photography competition for indigenous peoples and local communities youth. And this competition was an opportunity for them to express themselves through photography on the climate crisis and other related challenges that they're facing and to share their concerns and best practices to a wider audience. And, uh, and also, Speaking about the role of the intergenerational solidarity in our work, um, it reminds me of our special program on intellectual property for women entrepreneurs from indigenous and local communities. And this program is basically encourage women entrepreneurship, innovation and creativity related to traditional knowledge and culture. And we do so by helping our participants to make strategic and effective use of intellectual property tools in support of the business activities. And in this program, we have participants of different age. And uh, we encourage young people to apply. And during this program, in, in the margins of it, they, they have the opportunity to share and learn from each other's experience, and which we believe is really useful for them to sustain this intergenerational solidarity, but also to help them to develop the traditions based uh, businesses and projects. So this is just a few examples of how we try to to keep in mind the intergenerational solidarity in our work. Thanks for sharing that, Anna. Um, I'm coming to you, Noreen, and I know a lot of uh, young aspiring entrepreneurs are listening and you know, they're looking up to you and they're like, 
how do we, you know, how do we make it and how do we leverage on different generations to also support our vision? So maybe you can also give, um, you know, some learnings from your experience on not only what should be done, but what we should not do as well, or, or what kind of mistakes that we should avoid as we go into this journey of entrepreneurship. Uh, I've seen a question around skills, development, opportunities, and things like that. How can we link that by leveraging on allies in the, in the other generations as well? Um, I would like to speak specifically to the Filipinos in the room, but this is also true for everyone. There is a very popular Filipino writer, his name is Nick Joaquin, who said the identity of the Filipino is someone who is asking what is his identity? Um, you know, we've been also besieged by colonialism. Like, I look Chinese. I have Chinese ancestors, but I also have Spanish, probably Malay. Um, my family comes from up north in, in the Philippines. Probably we have indigenous blood. We don't know. And I think that's the reason why I love doing this work of Panublix, which marries culture, entrepreneurship, innovation. Um, there's really a really rich time, especially for Filipino innovators or any innovators, especially in the, for the lack of a better term, the global south. Um, I really don't like using that term, but it's a separate conversation um, because we really need to have assertion of our identity. And our, our Philippine national hero, Jose Rizal, actually had really rich um, understanding of the identity of the Filipino really is needs to look back, like way back before even the colonizers came. And that's when I discovered like the indigenous heritage. And um, although we don't work with all indigenous people, um, that's really how I also got to learn there's such richness in our culture. And once we tap into that culture, I personally believe there's a, that's a lot of room for innovation. Like when I look actually at, I went to Batanes up north and they, they're like the best seafarers of uh, Philippines rather. They make the best boats. And my co-founder who's a scientist and fisheries um, uh, uh, scientist as well, she said, Noreen, look at this. This is marine innovation centuries old marine innovation they don't have an engineering degree but they can like navigate the pacific oceans rough waters with these boats so it's amazing and i feel like if we look back to our indigenous roots that is already rich sources of innovation so i think that's one advice i guess um it's it's a really a self-discovery um what can we do because really it's really innovation um as our ancestors knew how to navigate by just looking at the skies and there's scientific principle behind that right but it's it's something that they've learned um and yeah um i think that's why we're so passionate also about this work that we do in in Penublix because it's that it's really like heritage passing it on and to your point to your question about the skills right like we work a lot with handloom weavers and not all of them are from indigenous communities because in the philippines like if it's an indigenous pattern for example we have to get permission from the National Commission of Indigenous Peoples. And of course, like protecting patterns is also something that we're keen to explore, especially with the YFO. Um, but we're also, the, the weavers have also expressed that they want to get the next generation, the young people to learn. The good news is there are a lot of young people who want to learn. And because of technology, I think that's what gets them involved. Um, because of the pandemic, the, uh, young Filipinos, modern Filipinos, even across the diaspora, are now interested in our heritage fashion. So we see a lot of kids in TikTok, for example, um, cosplay, but in our traditional costumes. So it's mm. actually very encouraging. And it shows um, our craft bearers, our weavers, that, hey, look, the new generation is appreciating our work. So. Yeah, a lot of, you know, other generations are going on TikTok as well. You know, I'm doing it with also my mother and other elders in, in my family, it's, it's, I think that's why mentorship is both sides. It's not one way to, to the other. I think you hit um, the nail on the head when you say identity, because I think that's the core of everything. We need to know who we are and what's our mission. So we'll be able to, um, you know, overcome, take on the journey and overcome all the hurdles. I think also you answering the question of Ikhlas, I see your, your question. I'm from North Africa. Most of the youth think uh, they want to leave their countries just because less opportunities. What is the solution for this? 
you know, you are doing this work in the Philippines. You are taking a challenge in your country and you're solving the issue. Herman, you're doing it in Mexico. You're taking a very particular challenge, the poorest area in your country, and you're solving an issue. There's so much we can do in our countries. I think this is the question I want to wrap up uh, the session with you all. All these young people who have so much energy, so much dynamism, uh, so much passion, but they feel they feel trapped or they feel stuck or they feel everything is against them. The regulations are not there. The policies are not there. The, there is exclusion because of age. You know, all of these challenges are facing them. And yet they have that identity. They want to do something, but sometimes they're pushed, right, to, to die in the Mediterranean. They're pushed to, to join, you know, terrorism and, and violence and things like that because, you know, they don't realize the power they have as young people to make the change in their community, positive, peaceful change. So this, I want you to, to wrap up with that kind of call to action. They, these kind of young people who really want to make it but face every day all these challenges, what, what's your inspiration words for them? Uh, we'll start with you, Herman. Well, yeah, one of the most important advices that I have been received uh, through this time where we develop our project is that please enjoy the process. Right now, we live in a, in a world that was focused only on the results. And when you want to create a very fruitful impact in your community, you have to face it. It will take time. It will demand a lot of effort. But I think that the main ingredient of all the social changes in the world demands passion. And even if, you know, like if you saw it as a, as a normal or, or a regular company, probably we say that, there is a lot of chocolatiers and chocolate companies around there, but we know that we are very special because we are doing it in a very special place in the world. We are taking care of a very important cultural heritage of, of the Mexican culture, and we totally understand that for, um, you know, like for complex uh, problems like the ones that we are facing here in the world, we need complex solutions. And complex solutions will demand time, will demand a lot of wisdom, and we are going to find that with intergenerational collaboration. So please just keep pushing, keep moving forward. And one of the other important things to know is that more than ever, the people that is creating a very valuable change in this world is now connected as we are right now in this room. So I want to congratulate every one of you that is going to create a change in your community. You are not alone. You're not alone, yes. Anna? Yeah, that's a good question. And yeah, I, I can imagine that depending on different situation, the, answers, the answer can be different, but I would say my general uh, thoughts on it is speak, going back to the intergenerational, intergenerational solidarity. I think it's useful and important to seek for advice and to share your concerns with elder, elders from your communities because they have this wisdom and this experience and maybe they have faced something like this before and they can help you with an advice. But at the same time, it's also important to find a synergy with other young people because when we are when we are united and together with with someone, we are getting stronger. So I would say to yes, to find support from all the generations. I think it's uh, crucial in, in such Absolutely. situations. Yeah, surround yourself with all of the generations. Uh, Noreen. Yeah. So um, the context across countries can be different, right? But I really remember this. I don't know who said it. I I think I heard it in a TED talk, but it's something like constraints read innovation like um of course you know in just from personal experience the COVID-19 pandemic really affected all of us I actually lost like significant income in just a few weeks because of the pandemic and but instead of being paralyzed I just had to activate this learning mindset so that's what I also like apply to myself as an entrepreneur and you know as an entrepreneur you get a lot of highs and lows and Recently, we just had like a critical business issue that we just had to solve. But every time I have a blocker, I like, okay, what is this telling me? What, what is this? What can I learn from this? And once you're in that learning mindset, you don't get paralyzed. And that's the key, just not to get paralyzed. And it's also like, there's fear. Yes, you acknowledge the fear, but fear can also be a data point. Like it's telling you something. 
but once you have that activation of wanting to learn, you would eventually find it. And that's why it's also, um, I guess it's also the creative and artistic process. And I like what Herman said, you have to enjoy the process as well. And if I think for me, if you find something, you know, because we really came through a, diff a really difficult time. I had family members passed away because of the pandemic, close friends also. So it really gives like, if, if mortality is staring you at the face, right? What will you do with the rest of your time? Might as well spend it in something worthwhile. And I guess first for me, it was just clear that, you know, you have to dedicate your time into worthy things. And if it's, this is something you can do back home, create a difference in your country or even just in your community, why not? That would give you meaning, that would give you happiness. And, you know, that's Absolutely. where you are. It's where you need it. Absolutely. I love what you said about rising in your fear and rising in your failure. Thank you so much uh, for your time, for sharing your stories with us, for the incredible work you do. We're so proud of you. Uh, you've been inspiring everyone here. And please, the audience, I see you quoting uh, the amazing quotes of them. Take it to Twitter, take it to social media, let everybody also learn and get these pieces of advice and these inspiring uh, words of wisdom. So I want to thank you all again. Um, join me, everyone, in using the hands up in the chat in thanking our panelists. And I want to also acknowledge that a lot of people have joined the conversation while we're here. Uh, people from Liberia, Egypt, Bangladesh, Yemen, Brazil. Keep on introducing yourself, sharing about yourself and your countries uh, as we go in the conversation. Before we move on to the next chat, I want to, bye bye. <laughs> Let's first hear from my sister, uh, Lebougen Lebiz, a South African poet, speaking of languages. She speaks four out of the 11 indigenous languages of South Africa. Uh, incredible. Uh, so the floor is yours, Lebo. Greetings, greetings. Good afternoon, sister. <clears throat> So I uh, really, really enjoyed the panel so far. And it's been really refreshing to hear young people so um, so enthusiastic, especially like Noreen was saying, after going through the pandemic and all of us having had such tumultuous once in a lifetime experiences and coming out, trying to put our front foot forward. Um, and uh, Nadine is a good friend of mine that we used to go to that I used to go to school with and contacted me with about two weeks left and was like, could you write something about this and to this theme? And I was like, my goodness, this is such a big thing. I've spent the past four years living in Beijing. I've just gotten back home and I'm trying to find my feet. Um, so this is really, really uh, a fantastic thing. So I will be doing one piece for you guys, just as a something to chew on. And if you would like it to be made available, I have no problem pu publishing it on my website and you guys can have a look at it. Uh, it's called These Hills. <clears throat> These hills are made of dreams and hunger. Thunder between thighs when we hurt each other. These hills are waves apart, distantly echoing of pleasure. Libraries made with bite marks make for the best historians. These hills and their echoes urge me to climb them as soon as I, my feet find level ground. These hills are a tornado. This tornado is a circus. The ringmaster went up the mountain, came back with two tablets, the first commandment. Well, he couldn't read that because he forgot to charge it. And the second commandment, we also couldn't read that because we had no Wi-Fi to get the update. So now we make up the rules as we like. Do not cut down a tree to its roots if you know not what children will still eat its fruits. Do not allow your children to believe in Batman. 
white Jesus or Santa Claus. One wears an erexia on a, cross, on a cross like a fashion statement. The other wears obesity like a vagrant's cologne. And the other is like a really messed up and could use some counseling, like dude, seriously. My friends and I started a church. I started it so I could marry the trapeze artist and the bearded lady and the guy who takes care of the show pony because everybody needs love. My church allows us to keep updating our vows. My church has an unbeliever section for those who still struggle but want to worship. We don't always face Mecca when we pray. The circus plays hide and seek within these hills and hearts. My church is a hill I have to climb every day. My church is a different hill every day. My hill doesn't always require that I pray and my prayers don't get answered every day. The trapeze artist leaves bike marks when she prays. The bearded lady keeps receipts every time you send her up a hill. I don't know how many hills I have crossed, how many prayers. The tornado dissipates. The circus is the only ground we have. It isn't holy. It isn't sinful. Just common. And a ground we can all call home. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think. Um... You were up for the two weeks challenge by Nadine and you provided us with a very powerful uh, poem. Um, I, I love what you said. We don't always face Mecca when we pray. Uh, my church is a different hill every day. It's, it's very powerful. I think we have all crossed hills and we rise. Uh, and if anyone in the audience right now, any young person who is in a hard time, who is pursuing a dream, who is, you know, trying to overcome these challenges, know that you will rise as well. So thank you again, Lebu, for your time and for uh, joining us today. Uh, now let's turn into our second chat with four young innovators who are helping us achieve one or more of the sustainable development goals. They work at the intersection of technology, science and inclusion. I want to welcome Chiara uh, Nerhin, innovator and co-founder of Steph Health Startup in South Africa. She also published a book I mean, she's only 22. The Youth Revolution. I want my copy, Kiara. <laughs> she is advocating for the protection of the environment through innovation. She's getting girls involved in the process and she works, uh, you know, in science, technology and culture. Our second panelist is Lamine Jauna, CEO and co-founder of uh, Gudu Pay, a financial technology application in the Gambia. He will tell us more about it. Lamine is an ICT professional for over nine years, working towards developing and fostering fintech ecosystem in the Gambia. Next is uh, Nadia uh, Ousu, Ousu, a youth advocate working in the intersection of technology, youth entrepreneurship, and climate action in Ghana. She's the partnership and engagement lead for United Youth Initiative for Africa. And finally, Sonia Shah, CEO and co-founder of Laura Beauty in the US, a wellness startup focused on using repurposed tobacco to address uh, topical skin issues that primarily uh, people of color face. Sonia is studying finance and entrepreneurship at UNC Chapel Hill in the US. I love UNC. I'm sure you're having a blast there, Sonia. So welcome all of you to this uh, panel, uh, very diverse innovations. I'm, I'm really excited to learn from all of you. So I want each of you to uh, really share with us what inspired you to create these solutions. Let's start with Lamine. Lamine, can you hear us? Yes, I can. 
Yes, Lamine, go ahead. Tell us about your innovation and what inspired you to start it. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's, it's good afternoon at my end in Banjul, and I'm sure it's evening somewhere else and morning to those who are still in the morning. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Aya, for that introduction. Uh, yes, um, back to the top. Happy International Youth Day to everyone. And uh, shout out to every young person that is doing uh, amazing and a great work out there and trying to close the gap. And it's, I, I think the theme alone, it's, it's great. Uh, intergenerational solidarity, it's, 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 it's a great team. I'm glad that we've chosen that, especially for those of us around this end of the world. Um, but to the question, um, well, uh, I deal with, um, I'm in a FinTech space. So we've built what is um, a digital mobile, solution a payment uh, solution but also serves as an aggregator between uh, financial institutions and consumers who are most likely uh, people but also institutions that want to receive payment um, this it's a very innovative uh, product because Gambia it's um, one country that rely 100 percent on caste uh, it's 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 that country that everything that you do, requires a physical cast and that has caused a lot of uh, problems uh, from governance, security risks, personal and a lot of issues and then uh, we had to come up with a solution of how do we mitigate the problem. Um, it's not it, it's not like we're trying to innovate but it's like how do we look at uh you know it's it's not a completely new thing but how do we innovate on what's in the market and bring something new not just to Gambia, but hopefully to the entire african populace so we don't just serve as a payment solution but we're also looking at serving as more of an aggregator uh for people that have financial issues, you have money at the, you have money at what bank? And we know that you can kill for two, three hours in Gambia and elsewhere in Africa just to get cash because almost everything you need to do with uh, you, you you need it's 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 cash required. So we help people get cash from different um, financial institutions, but also allow them to pay or transact basic needs. Um, using our platforms. Thank you for sharing that. Sonia? Hi, uh, good morning, afternoon, night, depending on where you all are coming from and happy International Youth Day. Uh, so again, my name is Sonia. I'm 18 years old. I'm from the United States. And I'm also the co-founder and co-CEO of a wellness early stage startup called Blurry Beauty. Um, so Blur Beauty kind of got its start back in 2020. Um, I had my co-founder and we were friends in high school and we both had an interest in skincare and we also realized that there weren't too many products on the market that catered to our type of skin, melanated skin, and the specific issues that we face, primarily hyperpigmentation. Um, and it was also through there that we found out about an international STEM and entrepreneurship competition called the Conrad Challenge, which was for high school students. And it basically challenged students all around the world to innovate and find solutions to different problems. Um, and it was through there that we discovered that tobacco crop could be repurposed and used to alleviate common topical skin issues that, such as the ones that we were facing, but also acne, eczema, sunburns, and more. Um, so it was kind of through there that we realized that this was a viable product that we could actually, you know, use tobacco, nicotine-free tobacco, and create this sort of novel skincare product to bring to the market and market it to people of color who were similar, who had similar skin to us and we're facing the same issues we had been our whole entire lives um and that was kind of our start and then upon finishing the challenge back in 2020 we realized that you know we have a prototype we have an idea that's been validated um and we realized we actually wanted to continue it and make it into a real product so that's kind of what we've been doing for the past two years is working on raising capital um manufacturing formulating our product and just branding our startup 
And why are you still studying? Uh, yeah, I am starting college in the fall. So yeah. Amazing. Okay, Chiara. Hi everyone and happy International Youth Day. Um, I'm super excited to be here and be joined with such incredible people. Um, my name is Kiara, originally from South Africa. Um, I'm a Gen Z technologist, um, inventor, um, author, and environmentalist. Um, a few years ago, I had won the Google Science Fair with a product to um, combat climate change. I was really inspired by um, or took notice of the drought affecting large parts of Southern Africa and parts of uh, South America and uh, created a product to essentially um, help crops maintain growth during periods of drought. Um, so essentially it could be applied to the soil of the plant and uh, sustain growth through um, periods where no water was available. Um, I then studied uh, computer science at Stanford in California. Um, I was in Time and Forbes Most Influential, um, and I wrote a book with Penguin Random House called Youth Revolution, um, showcasing the incredible young um, female innovators throughout the world, uh, tackling some of our biggest challenges and problems. Um, but I'm super excited to be here. Thanks, and for sure we'll come back to you on the gender aspect of this, so we can also you know, tap into that. Um, my sister, Nadia. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon from Accra, Ghana. I'm happy to be sharing this space with all of you. My big, generous sister, Aya, thanks to ITC and also WIPO for this very important discussion. Um, I would not say that um, I was inspired to be where I'm at. I would actually say that my passion for what I'm doing stemmed from a place of um, need and a place where it was out of urgency that young people stood up to, you know, um, ask for things they wanted. So right back at the university, my friends and I decided to start a um, United Youth Initiative for Africa. It was just started in our university dorms. We wanted to create um, a space where young people knew they could actually lead. And we, we found the SDGs to be our focal point, our guide. So since then, since 2016 till now, we've actually engaged about 5,000 young people in digital literacy and also our SDG sensitization and awareness program where we've had young people out of school youth, um, students in their urban areas and the rural areas, and even elderly people who are part of our projects to engage in sustainable development goals. This is not just because that's what we want to do, but we actually are calling for um, an Africa where young people are leading an Africa where young people and women are at the forefront of the development, and also an Africa where there's gender equality. So for me, um, it's not just an inspiration, but it's an urgency and it's also a need. So happy to be sharing this panel with all of you. Thank you so much. You all are so inspiring. <laughs> I mean it. Um, I mean, I mean, each one of you really, if we want to take lessons, Lamine has nine years of experience, so things don't happen overnight you, you need to put in the work uh, Sonia is studying and testing her ideas so you need to get out there and knock all the doors uh, Chiara wrote a book I think it's you wrote it at 16 years old I read in 2015 uh, so you you know you have an idea to just just go out there and, and do it right um, you know and and also Nadia is solving the sustainable development goal so um, I think you're not only entrepreneurs you're change makers and that's what we need today we, we don't need more, we need better. We don't need more wealth. We need to better use the wealth we have and, and, and you know, be innovators. And that's why today's conversation is about that. I want to go into the intergenerational aspect. So I'm sure somehow you would have faced ageism in your work. Uh, you're young entrepreneurs with layers of identities. And obviously, uh, as young people, we're not a homogeneous group. I am young, female, African, and the list goes on. And with each identity comes exclusion because of age or misogyny because of gender or Islamophobia because of nationality. Uh, and the list of challenges goes on. So as we celebrate all of you today of being incredible innovators, we know that every day you're overcoming a challenge. So I wanna hear from you, how do you leverage on intergenerational solidarity or on generational allies in your space 
to, to overcome these challenges, to support the work you do, to believe you know, in, and invest in, in the ventures that you're, you're going into. Uh, I'll start with Lamin. Lamin, can you hear us? Yes, sure. Um, yes, I think um, my area of specialization comes with a lot of challenge, especially trying to uh, innovate something that has been um, you, in a kind of society where people are so reluctant to change, and uh, especially the older generation uh, who have for decades been used to holding physical cars and spending that to the everyday use cases and trying to uh, introduce them to a modern technology uh, of a digital wallet. Now, that it's kind of, it, it, it's not, they, they don't feel that much comfortable uh, to save money using a digital wallet as opposed to what they know from they gain from from not even banks because this is a popular i i, I come from a, com, a country that has less than 30 percent bank population so you have what 70 percent unbanked population and most of this i the older generation that have been working for years but been used to the physical cars and these are the people that also run the economy. So it's not just about, because Gambia is one of the countries that leads when it comes to um, it, it's one country that spends almost everything. Uh, you have over $2 billion a day, which is over $40 million that circulates just cash on a daily basis. So almost everything we do in a population of 2 million people goes around from one hand to another, just from buying drugs to supermarket shoppings. So with over 16 banks, the ratio is still over 30%, over 70% of the population on bank. And now we're introducing a digital wallet. And not just that, but we're telling you, you can buy, you can buy drugs from, from, from drug stores, you can shop from uh, supermarkets, you can, you can use our aggregate APIs to do e-commerce shoppings. You know, you can order food from food delivery apps. So you can literally do everything that your physical cars can do for you with a digital option. But because I, I, th I think that's where the challenge comes in. And it's important we talk about these things because even though we're over 60%, 60 to 65% uh, youth population, but then the, 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 the workforce is more of the adult population. And this is where the money circulates from. So, but then uh, interestingly, a lot of these people, even the literate ones, are reluctant to change because I and mean, then these are the people you expect to adopt to these kind of technologies much easier. But then it's even harder to get these people convinced, even government, forest theaters, and even private companies to adopt using these technologies versus to what they know. They still will want cash payments or at worst at, at worst case scenarios checks. But then we've we've seen a lot of them will still complain of having bounce checks of millions of dollars, but they still prefer checks to a digital payment that is in real time and they can get notifications to any of the banks that they bank in work. Mm. So that has really helped in us understanding the mindset of these people and actually um, doing an intensive uh, campaign and our education and awareness to reach to mostly this 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 adult uh, population to sensitize them, but also educate them about the value for a digital currency versus to what they have and what they know. So we've been privileged to not only uh, talk to young people that are easily uh, 
adopting technology uh, and it's easy to reach them with just social media with just some few clicks and few campaigns but then the chunk of the population that have the money and that are leading the workforce to 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 believe in 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 in, in our product but most especially to trust in the product and it's so working. it's kind of challenging and it's yeah, working it, it, right? it's really working it's it's yeah it's really working uh, it's it's like previous speaker said it's uh you you just have to trust the process and that's what we have been doing mm -hmm. it's not been easy and like you said i've nine years experience i've worked in nairobi um where today mobile money dominates the entire world with mpesa and now everyone talks about fintech i've worked and studied in dakar as a software engineer and business development officer but then we've seen recently how this the Senegalese economy has been torn mm -hmm. more to a fintech space and a lot of investment has been done just 2021 one company alone has secured more than two billion dollar investment so and then if senegal can then it's high probability that we can because these are the same people with the same cultures gambia it's literally inside senegal if you guys have Mm -hmm. uh, had the chance to look at the so map. let me let me let me by Senegal. yeah let me let me get the the young woman perspective here because you know a few years ago oxfam mm -hmm. released uh, a report saying that eight men own the same wealth as half of the world right so when we talk even about this yeah. financial freedom we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about only one uh one uh half of society and and the other half is completely excluded so i want to come to you chiara yeah. because you also work with girls and i want to get your perspective um uh, on, on the gender perspective of this conversation i remember when i was the youth envoy i made sure i have allies who are elder women ambassadors diplomat ministers who really are paving the way and uplifting young women to 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 occupy uh, uh you know the, the space um because whether we like it or not, if you're young and female, whatever position you will you will take, whatever success you will have, you will always, uh, you know, need that intergenerational support to, you know, to to pass the gatekeepers who who look at you as this kid. What is this kid doing here, right? Uh, and you have to assert yourself every day. So, how do you do that working with girls? And also, what would be your advice? Also, this intergenerational collaboration. How do we? Uh, um, how do we foster it? Uh, do we reach out to these other women? Do we make allyship and so on? And I'll come to you both, uh, Sonia and Nadia, after that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think something that I think the conversation um, should be centered around even more than it is, is not just access, but being able to um, really lead and pioneer those fields. And I think that when that mind shift happens, especially for young girls getting into the space that not only are they young, but they're also female, which is um, really difficult to just get involved in. Um, I, I think what we really need to start talking about even more is um, how they get access, which is um, just being in those spaces, being able to learn and, and be educated, but how do they, rethink what it means to innovate or create in those spaces, right? Um, and I think that once they have that understanding that they can push the boundaries and, and pioneer in those skills, even though they are young and even though they are female, which is um, not only getting access, but then sometimes feeling like they don't necessarily have the same sort of knowledge or background as some of their older counterparts, I think that mind shift is really important. And from, I guess, from my perspective, I've always kind of seen being young as an asset, um, keeping in mind that, yes, young people do not have sort of the background as, let's say, somebody that has studied for multiple years, and that is fine, but they also have perspectives that are uh, different. They're new. When, when we look at a research journal, we might have just read it for the first time and we have different um, backgrounds or perspectives. We come from different places. And being able to contribute those with people that are um, more educated, that are older than you, I think there's something 
really interesting in that in that kind of collaboration. But then when you bring in being female um, in terms of the kind of fields of innovation, um, that's kind of where I see a lot of the most interesting things happening, which is being young and being female and contributing in those spaces. And so I'm really excited about the contributions that um, young people are having in, in kind of science and innovation, but then um, the unique contributions of females. And I couldn't be more sort of passionate about their access and their opportunity to, to do that. Mm. I like that mindset that being young and female is not a synonym of struggle, you know, like when we say that it means we have a lot of issues to deal with, but also that means we have superpowers <laughs> and uh, and there is a lot we can do. Uh, I want to come to you, Nadia, but keeping in mind this question from Wissal, who says, as a young woman, how can I make my voice heard in the political sector where the youth are not encouraged to participate, at least not in my country? Thank you so much. Um, that, that question is, it, it reminds me of a little things that happened. You know, quite being young, um, I realized that I didn't have so many um, figures to look up to because in the space at, at that time, we didn't have more inclusion at a political level. In Ghana, the, 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 the political system was, is even actually still now highly dominated by men. So for, for this conversation that we started, we are trying to um, advocate for an intergenerational success where there's partnership and collaboration. So what I would say to this is that sometimes um, one key thing we've been advocating for is having um, youth um, delegations as part of our members of parliament, having youth assistance, having youth um, presence in every aspect of the political system. I, I think with these conversations around intergenerational um, dialogue, intergenerational solidarity, we're trying to create a, close a gap where there's um, a difference in variety of ages. We want the older generation to be able to look at us young people and know that we are filled with so much creativity, so much exuberance, so much knowledge to actually bring forth to the table. We keep asking to have young people on the table. If they don't bring young people to the table, they will not know what we have to offer. We're trying to close that superiority gap where older people feel they have all the knowledge. Like um, Sir Kwakwa said, he learned from his uncles. We also want to learn from the older generation. We want to learn from the older politicians. We want to, to imbibe some skills. We want um, resources. We want collaborations. We want mentorship because know, knowing more from you as um, a past envoy, I'm sure that the recent envoy has imbibed certain traits, learned from your past mistakes, learned from your 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 your, your short falls and your even your successes. So we need a, a sort of mentorship. We need some guidance. We want to close this gap. We can't do that if there's disparity. We need unison. We need to come together as an older generation and a younger generation where there's collaboration, where we can foster peaceful coexistence, knowing that we just won't have one earth. And if we're able to work in harmony, knowing that we can fall back to the older generation when, when there's, there's an outbreak, there's a pandemic, we know that we can fall back to the older generation for knowledge. The older generations can look at as young people and even come for some of our expertise Everyone here is doing amazing stuff. There's so much plethora of knowledge and we can actually make use of that as a generation where we're learning from each other. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, you know, the especially the the aspect where we we have this pressure, you know, from all generation that you are going to save the world. Go on, young people people you know uh, young people are striking young people are innovating young people are doing in the work but there is this pressure that you know the crisis we live in today has to be saved by this generation it it actually has to be saved by all of us you know because it's a continuation we are inheriting these struggles and we cannot solve it alone um, so I, I love that call from you and I want to encourage everyone to continue posting because I'm going to take a final round of questions before we close I love when the chat is vibrant, so continue to ask those tough questions um, and share your thoughts uh, as we move on in the conversation. I want to come to you, Sonia, and you know, in, in my experience, uh, when I started working on this intergenerational 
co-leadership and solidarity, my mindset was create more dialogues. And I organized 100 intergenerational dialogues. And in my mind was like, let's create dialogues. We're not communicating. We're not understanding each other languages. We're speaking you know, uh, uh, in different fronts. But then after we've done the dialogue, now I'm thinking, is the dialogue enough? Because then when the young person needs the senior or the elder to show up, do they actually show up? And now I think we need more action rather than we need to move beyond or with the dialogue. I don't know what you think about it. Yeah, I think it's um, really important to do both. Uh, dialogue has been a big part, actually, of my startup journey. Um, I found that especially like just reaching out to particularly female fellow female entrepreneurs especially older ones they definitely are always willing to call and talk to younger ones and give advice wisdom and I think the dialogue is really important but what's even more in my experience that's been like I think honestly just a bit surprising in a good way is that they are really willing to show up um if you ever need anything like I was on a call about a couple months ago with a fellow female founder who's had her own startup for a couple years. And she was saying that once Laura gets more to where we're planning to launch, she would be willing to help us, you know, set up branding, marketing, um, and helping a lot more with like actually launching. So I actually, in my experience, I have been met with a lot of people who are willing to actually act upon, you know, their words, not just give advice, but also, you know, help. Um, but I think the funny thing is, is that I, in my experience, it's mainly been female entrepreneurs who do that, which is really cool that there's you know, this culture of like womanhood who really want to help younger female entrepreneurs succeed. Because um, I definitely had have some bad experiences with other male entrepreneurs or leaders in this industry who I've worked with. And I've definitely faced ageism, sexism. But I do think it's very good and strong that we have this culture of womanhood who really want to see other female entrepreneurs succeed. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really happy whenever I hear that women are supporting women so we can dismantle this myth that women don't support women. They do support women. And we have been thriving because a lot of the women paved the way for us. But also I think my father is, I always say my father is a feminist. He never feminist, but some really you know, allowed me to be and become even though we disagree on many things, but at least he was there you know, to get my back. And I think it's important. And a lot of men always ask their role in this mentorship and this, you know, generational collaboration. It's really to, 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 to get our back, right? When you are on the front line, just be there to, to support. So we are wrapping up uh, this amazing panel, which I don't want to end, but uh, we are quite on time. I want to give you all uh, 30 seconds to inspire this audience who is listening to us there different generations, but I think you'd speak more to the young generation, to the young people, um, maybe the girls as well, who are aspiring and who are facing all these hurdles and all these challenges. Um, what would you, you know, advise them? What would be your words of inspiration? I will start with, with who wants to start? Let's, let's do it popcorn style. <laughs> I, can, I can go. Go ahead, Kara. I, I think something that I would have loved to hear when I was starting in my journey was the idea that when you hear these stories, it's easy to kind of think about your own journey as maybe not being on the same timeline as those people or not being in the same sort of, um, maybe you have different struggles or you have struggles that are in, uh, kind of come in your life in a different way that it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, kind of resonating with every one of us or kind of be similar to any one of us. Um, but if you can kind of take the message that that um, your uh, contribution in the space is unique and you should make that contribution, that's really what I would have loved to hear when I was listening to panels like this when I was younger and thinking about innovation. Is that I was always trying to draw those threads between me and one of those panelists or speakers and realizing that there might not be those threads, but getting those that that inspiration to be able to do things that you are passionate about and realizing that spaces aren't necessarily meant or designed for you, but that's why you have to enter them, design it for yourself. And in doing so, you're designing it for all the other uh, young people that come behind you and young females that also come behind you. Um, so but so yeah. get the spark, get the spark, but don't necessarily compare yourself to others. You have your own journey. I love that. I love that, Kiara. All right. I'm going to popcorn Next. it to 
um, <laughs> Nadia. Okay, thanks so much, Aya. Um, for me, I would talk about the entrepreneurship angle. I would like to say that um, growing up, I didn't fancy having female role models, but in my career, more women have shaped how my career has looked like. And I would say that women should be able to close their eyes and visualize the parts they want to and know that they can actually create that part. Let's not be so different. Let's always know that we have um, a foundation, a block where we can rely on. It's looking like the world is going in a place where there's no assistance, but there's assistance when you're looking for it. We have amazing women. We have amazing leaders. We have amazing role models. Find someone, know that this is not a lone struggle. You have a community out there for you. So happy International um, Youth Day. Amazing, close your eyes and manifest it and ask for help, very important. Sonia? Yeah, I think honestly, just speaking on the same topic and especially speaking to a lot of female entrepreneurs out there and fellow young people, um, I know that so many of us have ideas that it can be really seem really daunting to actually pursue, but I do know that, especially for female entrepreneurs, um, I mean, obviously the startup world is still very male dominated, but I think that the more women, young people that decide to get into the space, decide to pursue any ideas or innovations they have, the more, the better it is. Cause I think it's really important um, that just more women enter this space because then you're not just, you know, inspiring yourself, but you're also inspiring even younger women. Cause I know that's what kind of led me to feel confident enough to enter the world is that I saw other women out there um, who are already doing so. And I think also as more people join, more people from different backgrounds, you're inspiring people, you know, from other backgrounds, um, you know, so like there's just like more diversity of female entrepreneurs out there. Paving the way, I love it. Let me, final words with you. Um, thank you so much. Um, yes, I would say to every young person, especially aspiring and young entrepreneurs, um, be innovative enough, be creative. There's always a missing puzzle out there. Even to those great uh, platforms to great ideas, we can still add up to that. So be critical thinkers. The world is full of problems and it needs innovators. It needs creative minds. So be the innovators, be critical thinkers and fix the missing puzzle. There's always something new to add. And then that's it. So, and let's not just wait to be, to, 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 to be mentees, but then we can always give. It doesn't really matter how small you know, there's always someone willing to learn. And it doesn't really matter how small it is. Let's share and let's collaborate. Thank you. And be whatever the hell you want to be. There is no limit. There is no impossible. Uh, I'm so inspired. Thank you so much. Nadia, Sonia, Chiara, Lamine, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing with us and keep it going. Keep it going. It's not easy, but you, you're, you're rising and I'm really proud of you. With this, we come to almost the end. Before we wrap up, I want to welcome Claire uh, Stergold, Community Manager at International Trade Center at the Youth and Trade Program. Claire, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Aya, and thanks to all our amazing speakers from today. I hope that you in the audience are super, super motivated and re-inspired to take on whatever challenges stand in your way. Um, first off, I want to give a big thank you to our co-organizers at WIPO, especially Edward Kwaka, Assistant Director General at WIPO, and of course, our amazing moderators for today, Ms. Aya Chebi, the former African Union Youth Envoy, and as well a diplomat. I, it's been an amazing session. I'm really, really, I'm taking notes the whole time and learning so much from you guys as well. Just a big takeaway, you're never too old to learn, so keep Keep it going, keep the networking going after this session. Lots of people were sharing their information in the chat box. So let's keep those connections going and support one another, whether we're all youth or whether we're intergenerational as the theme of today. Let's support one another to really tackle the challenges that stand in our way. And of course, to help achieve sustainable development for this planet, as we only have one planet. And some people were also in the audience highlighting that. 
So before we let you all go for today, I wanted to just share a little bit of information with you all. Um, I have the pleasure of at the International Trade Center, working with a global community of youth entrepreneurs such as yourselves. This community is 30,000 strong people from all across the world, supporting one another, learning, connecting, and trying to solve the challenges of today and tomorrow. And actually, last year we conducted a survey of youth entrepreneurs in this community. And I think it's really good to close with some data points that you guys can take away today. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen. I hope you can all see that. Um, so as I mentioned, we conducted the survey and a lot of young entrepreneurs out there are already working with a mentor but more want to be connected with a mentor. And this is really the value of intergenerational solidarity, whereby mentors can support young people, youth can support other young people. So if you're worried that you don't have the skills, you don't have the networks, don't be afraid, help your peer, help someone else who's along at an earlier stage in their journey, really support one another because people want to learn from you. They want to learn from your story. They want to know what you're doing. So mentorship is really important in a young entrepreneur's journey and supporting them along the way. So we wanted to share with you that that's a critical way that we can enhance intergenerational solidarity. And seasoned mentors can provide support to youth entrepreneurs along a variety of different topics, be it soft skills, be it access to networks, be it technical knowledge, there's a variety of ways. So once again, don't be afraid to jump in there and start supporting the next generation or your peer. There's always something that you can share. And just to also give you some, some guidance and some inspiration, youth really want to learn in particular areas, be it digital marketing, be it what it's like to work in a big corporate, be it how you build your network, go out there and mentor someone else and provide those skills so that they can learn from your experiences. Also, what we learned in this survey is that young entrepreneurs need financing to help them scale their business ventures. They cannot do it alone. And we, as international organizations, as associations supporting youth can play a key role. More than 90% of young entrepreneurs are seeking funding in 2022. They're looking for various types of funding, but as the international organizations, we can help them overcome this critical gap and funding is a key way of helping these youth-led businesses to scale up. So when it comes to what young entrepreneurs want to use that funding for, it's really building new infrastructure, tapping into new markets, developing new products, and hiring more staff, whether it's young people or old people. We, as again, international organizations can really help them to tackle these big challenges by providing funding to youth-led businesses at any stage of their business growth to help them take on new staff, to develop new services. And they'll use these new strategies that they've learned through mentorship, the new funds that they've acquired to continue to build their companies, to start sourcing from new suppliers, consider starting a new business or piloting some new technology. So together we can really help them by providing funding and providing support. Finally, when it comes to which type of support youth entrepreneurs want in 2022, as mentioned, they want access to finance, but they want that coupled with training. They want that coupled with technical support, and they want more information about which markets are best for them to go into. So we, again, coming back to us, we, the UN, we associations, we other mentors and experienced um, investors, experienced business people, we can help youth entrepreneurs through supporting them to access trade promotion services, to tap into different markets, to get involved with youth associations, to support the incubators and accelerators to better serve youth on the ground. There's so many ways that we can create more seamless um, ecosystems that enhance the abilities of youth to be able to scale those business ventures. And this survey just really proved that information. So in closing on this youth day, and in solidarity with youth, let's pledge to support young people to achieve their goals by acting as mentors, by helping them with access to networks, by providing training and by providing financing to their businesses at any stage of the journey so that they can really scale up their ideas and help us to tackle the SDGs. So with that, I'd like to say thank you all again for being here today and back to you, Aya, to close out the session. Thank you so much, Claire, for this 
create concrete ways of engagement because I think that's what young people always ask. Enough talking, more engagement, more concrete stuff. Um, I want to also thank uh, Nadine, Anais, Julia, everyone uh, behind the scene who seems to be an all women powerful crew, huh? just saying. <laughs> Uh, Uncle Edward, I see you stayed all the session, a true listener and a true uh, champion for youth. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you all the participants who have been here and for choosing this event. I know there's so much stuff happening today, so thanks for, for choosing this. Uh, there is still more because uh, ITC and WIPO are together hosting two more activities, spreading Youth Day into a Youth Month. So please join the film screening of Youth Made Films taking place on 20th of September and for those of you in Geneva there is an art uh, exhibition fair at WIPO campus on the 4th of October. All this information will be posted on the chat. We look forward to seeing you all in the upcoming uh, exciting events and with that we come to the end of today's uh, event. Thanks so much for tuning in. Happy International Youth Day! Woohoo! <laughs> bye bye.